What is interesting about the supercharger setups is that as they're constantly on, the they're not necessarily generating, com, you know, compressed air. They're not generating what we would call boost. All right, or uh, what I would, which is positive atmosphere. All right, we talked about atmosphere before. Positive atmosphere. So positive atmosphere is how many, how much more air pressure or how, uh, how much more air density is there versus outside atmosphere. Okay. So superchargers aren't necessarily producing a lot of positive atmosphere until a certain RPM. That's just how, how it operates. So like in the Yamaha example, eh, you're going 40 miles an hour you're pretty much just a naturally aspirated ski because that supercharger, although it's spinning, it's not producing compressed air until you get up towards a certain RPM. Why is that? Okay, let's educate you guys. The reason being is that the, the fins, all right, the actual blades on the supercharger wheel at a certain RPM actually start to compress uh, to draw in enough and compress air to push through the intake manifold. All right. Same thing goes with, with seated. All right. There's no on and off switch. It doesn't come on like your AC compressor. It's just constantly spinning. Now, interestingly enough, let's talk about Kawasaki's TVS, which is twin vortices supercharger. All right. What's a twin vortices? Okay. Uh, a lot of guys call them a screw style compressor. All right. Or a blow through uh, supercharger. And the way that works is that you have twin shafts that are grooved and they interlock and they interlock perfectly. They're almost touching. In fact, the Teflon edge coating is because there is some minor contact, but it's negligible. It hardly produces heat that would upset the, you know, the, the boost being created. So those, those screws inside of the case of your Kawasaki supercharger are doing this and they're interlocking. Well, why are they interlocking? Because there's air trapped in there. And as they, as they lock together, they're compressing that air. All right. So that compressed air is being shoved through that supercharger and cram down the throttle body of that engine, and there's enough fuel being metered to meet that level of positive atmosphere to create a good positive charge. And you have a well-running supercharged engine. Okay. Well, how does a turbo work? Turbo is interesting. At low RPM, turbo's not moving. It's just sitting there. It might go like a little pinwheel, all right? But it's not producing any boost. Even when you're cruising along, it's not producing any boost. But suddenly, you really romp on the throttle, and all of a sudden, that thing goes, you go, rrr, rrr, and it kicks in, all right? And it that feeling, that seat of the pants, whoop, whoop, when the boost kicks in, People are like, oh, what is that? Well, a lot of guys call that turbo lag. That is just traditionally called turbo lag. The turbo lag is the gap in seconds between throttle and the boost hitting compression and develop and creating positive atmosphere. So it could be a quarter second. It could be fractions of a second. It could be thousands of a second. All right. And it just goes, it just, however long the, it takes for, you know, you grab full throttle, all that exhaust has to come through and hit the wheel to start spinning the turbo. And that turbo starts producing a whole bunch of positive atmosphere. And all of a sudden you go, whoa, and you yank on it. All right. The early turbo R12X and F12X Hondas had very noticeable turbo lag. Now, interestingly enough, we're going to talk about this. This is actually kind of funny. Ya or Yamaha, sorry. Honda smartly sized the tubing 
and sized the turbo down and even sized, or not really sized, but they also dialed the boost or wastegate. Uh, yeah, the wastegate. I, I don't know what I'm saying, boost. The wastegate so that it artificially had more positive atmosphere. Why? Well, the reason being is we talked about exhaust last week. An exhaust can be artificially sped up with a smaller diameter tube. All right? Smaller diameter exhaust. Because that increases velocity. A big, wide coffee can does not generate velocity. But a smaller diameter fumes go out faster. All right? The pulse width is going all the way out instead of pump, 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 pump. Anyway, so I'm trying to help you guys visualize it without having a whiteboard behind me. So anyways, Honda had a smaller turbo but had smaller piping. And the reason why that is smaller turbo and smaller piping was that the way the the turbo lag would not be as noticeable. It wouldn't come on and yank hard. All right. You could feel it come on. If you were paying attention, you could feel it in your feet and your arms. You could feel it come on. Now, what's interesting though is what they did in 2009. 2009 comes around, they go to the bigger engine. They go to the 15 or the 1.5 liter, 1500. Okay. So now a bigger displacement engine is doing more work and they still had the same size turbo and same size piping. Well, wouldn't you think that would restrict it? No, it was, it was making about 195 horse. That was it. It was making about 195 horse. Actually, I'm rounding up. It made like 192, if I remember the dyno sheet. All right, this was 13 years ago, so or 12 years ago. So anyways, what they did is that they let the natural displacement, the big displacement of the engine, do a lot of the low-end work. And then when you really got on it, turbo would pop up. Hey, guys. Thanks for hanging out. This clip was taken from our weekly podcast that we record here every Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to watch the whole video, you can go to the Watercraft Journal's YouTube channel, go to Playlists, and then click on Live Sessions. You're going to see it there. Otherwise, go ahead and leave a like, a comment, and definitely subscribe to the channel. It helps us grow. And again, thanks again for watching our videos, and we hope to see you soon.